All right, excited for the episode today. I've got Anton at Flashpoint DC. Um, pretty good friend. I've known him for, for a couple of years now, but met him at a happy hour, uh, maybe about three weeks ago. And I was like, look, you know what? It's time for you to get on to the YouTube show, um, onto, the, onto the show. Um, so excited to have you here, Anton. Um, Pleasure to be here, Joe. Good, good to see you. And um, let's just catch up on all things DC and, and asset management. And so let's let's maybe start with your your background. You know, your career. Where did you where did you study? What were kind of the industries that you focused on? And and how did you get into DC? Yeah, uh, it's been it's been a long time already. So, uh, but my dad is a laser physicist uh, from um, from Russia. So a, la a laser was... physicist. Laser physicist. Yeah. Okay. So, so just like my dad, um, I, I thought I wanted to be a laser physicist. Oh wow! Okay. And so he um, immigrated from uh, from Russia in two thousand. Uh, different country back then. Yeah. Uh, different environment. I think everybody wanted to get into Russia, not not out of Russia. Um, and so we immigrated. Um, it might sound, you know, hilarious, but we immigrated to Alabama. So. So I went from basically a capital uh, of, uh, of oil money yeah. um, into backyard of America. Yeah. Uh, so, so quite an interesting transition, I must say. Um, and, what was it uh, Was there like a laser? He, yeah, he is exactly. So he got a position as a research professor. Um, uh, together, they reunited with his um, uh, old friend, and yeah. um, he did a few stints. But Alabama is where he ended. So mm -hmm. I went into you know uh, middle school, then high school. Um, but then it was time to you know get to choose college, and education is actually uh, you know free in Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. So so yeah. I decided to follow my dad's footsteps and basically move back in two thousand and four. Yeah. Um, and get into college and uh, basically study to become laser physicist. Um, roughly by senior year, I kind of figured out, okay, like it's 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 unlikely to be my thing. Um, and so I got into you know business and, and finance. You know, basically like as a as an applied math and physics uh, major, uh, finance wasn't you know hard thing to pick up. So you know. Did did this uh, certification of uh, uh, of CFA uh, like level one exam? You know, kind of got my education in finance through through just the book, and got into KPMG corporate finance. Did that for about a year, uh, then ended up uh, on the uh, on the prop desk of a large institutional um, pension fund fund manager, basically doing a lot of bond trading and a little bit of equity. Um, then it moved a couple of years down the road It moved into kind of a private equity gig, uh, with one of the previous guys that I worked in the pension fund. Mm -hmm. Um, then I did my startup, uh, because it was, you know, quite, quite a vivid times. Everybody was Facebook just did an IPO. It was still Facebook, not meta then. Uh, so a lot of, you know, venture capital dollars were unlocking back in 2011. Yeah. Well, and so tried my entrepreneurship gig, figured that, you know, this is what it is to build a product. Um, but once we got to about the seed stage, you know, 20K of monthly revenue, figured that um, it's actually not something that I'm too passionate about. Um, and I met two guys, you know, uh, investment bankers from Morgan Stanley and UBS. Um, and they were launching their, they just launched their first fund. It was like a $10 million fund. And so I pretty much joined uh, the organization. Um, and over the last decade, we basically built that into uh, 500 million assets in the management, multi-product uh, company with not just VC, but also venture debt and a secondary arm. Um, and so uh, to, today we manage about six funds, um, but the strategy has you know remained the same as to focus on founders that are coming from you know, very good STEM background, um, basically Central Europe and Israeli founders, um, and they go global. Um, and so mainly because there is access to capital is cheaper in those regions. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, um, and then there is no local markets there. Um, so they have to go global. Um, 
And so you basically go for founders that are um, that are, have global aspirations, but you know, mm -hmm. um, tighter access to capital. Um, and so you end up winning um, on alpha, and that's where you build um, you build return. Um, it's very so hard to yeah. make return in the U.S., but yeah. like in other parts of the world, it's it's quite quite possible yeah. to do. So for the audience, let's unpack how a prop desk works versus a typical um, trading desk, right? So I'm I'm assuming you know a typical trading desk, you're working for a hedge fund, there's assets on the management. And you're a portfolio manager, right? So you manage, you know, because of your seniority, you're managing a certain uh, book of business that, which is, I'm assuming, LP capital. But a prop desk, some of the different, I mean, prop desk, that, from my understanding, um, is, is what it sounds, right? They prop up some capital and they give you this capital to kind of just trade again. I guess. Well, basically, yeah, basically, it was, you know, 95% it was uh, pension money. And so it was, you know, pretty conservative strategy. So, so it's not like we, millions, right? You're actually buying like, you know, very conservative, uh, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So exactly. So 95 percent is like very conservative portfolio. You yeah, buy, you know, three five year duration bonds. Uh, you know, they give you, you know, three five percent yields. You know, trying to optimize, you know, where on the yield curve should you position mm -hmm. yourself so you can get extra twenty bips, you know, return. Um, but you know, 5% of that, uh, capital was pretty much like you can do anything. And so, yeah. um, and so, you know, as, as a, as a physics background person, I said, let's, let's, let's look at technology and, you know, it was a vibrant sector. It's, you know, one of those industries that, you know, have high growth. And so mm -hmm. if you look historically in, in terms of, you know, what has been, you know, building up, um, uh, build, building up value, it's been you know high growth stocks pretty, pretty much, and so because market caps tend to very much correlate with you know revenue growth and market capture, and so technology companies are the ones to basically um, to basically capture it. Um, in the late you know seventies and eighties, you know there were also consumer companies, but I think over the last like two three decades, it's been mostly tech companies that really um grasped um grasp the the market um market value yeah um so on the on the trading side you know how are you doing the rebalance so i know you know essentially typical portfolio managers that are managing money for a buy side equity shop you know a large buy side firm you know they're they're managing their weightings they're managing their holdings they're also calculating um you know they're also reading a lot of news right so would you say kind of your practice is similar to kind of a portfolio manager doing more conservative investments you know because a lot some of these portfolio managers for large buy side investments you know they're not, they're not actively trading they're they're um they're doing a lot of long-term research in a certain sector after they do that research they read the news and then you know they kind of look at what the market is doing to drive their holdings and then they kind of like periodically rebalance so how often were you rebalancing at a um a bond well, yeah on the on the on the bond side um i mean you you because it, the position was quite large it was yeah. basically like a few billion dollars oh, and wow. so um basically there was a risk management uh, department that kind of set the frameworks you know which sure. sectors you can like go and like up to how much and then um, on the prop desk, it was basically, uh, you know, debt research, you know, to make sure that, you know, we select the names that are that are better and there were a few traders, you know, yeah. to, to executing that. Um, on the equity side, um, um, basically, there was um, there was a little bit more room. It was more, I'd say, um, risk reward driven. Um, and so you basically look for arbitrage you know if you have two companies that are relatively operating in the same um, market and one is valued like 30 40 percent cheaper than the other one and then you have certain factors that they could in impact that value unlocking um you basically bet on that and if you want to hedge that against the index you could do that and so so that was more more absolute return driven um, and yeah. so um, name specific uh, but the bond bond part is was more like kind of sector allocation and trying to bid the index by like extra percent and a half 
-hmm. And so if the index yeah. generates like five and then you do like six and a half, you've done well. So uh, <laughs> there you, you don't expect to outperform the index that substantially by you know picking the uh, by picking the the right name because everybody kind of correlates with you know how the interest rate market moves and yeah um, yeah no that makes sense and then tell me a little more about you know your the path into VC right so the prop depth um, was really interesting you probably did a lot of quantitative management you you definitely learned a lot of risk management so what you know do you feel like some of that laser physicist within you to kind of be like, look, you know what, let me, you know, laser, whenever I think of lasers, I think of like projections, sci-fi and the future. So you feel like that curiosity kind of drove your interest in technology? Yeah, I think, I think it's, there's a lot of similarities, uh -huh. you know, in terms of, you know, being inside kind of a lab and being inside of a startup and, and managing a VC fund. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, like, what's a business? A business is a set of experiments. Um, and, and I mean, some people like run that business and that's how we like run around ours. Basically, um, you know, any idea or any startup ultimately is a set of hypotheses, mm -hmm. you know, whether like it realizes or not, you know, depends on whether, you know, whether you're right or not and whether the, um, the, the team that was able to run those experiments is, is good or not. But, um, uh, but there's a lot of similarities. You yeah. set certain assumptions and then you verify certain assumptions against that. And, you know, in, a, in, a, in the physics world, you know, that assumption could be, uh, you know, can you construct a certain laser system? Will it be like powerful enough to, to power the next system? And then business is, can you bring the churn to a certain level that it makes interesting to basically put more money into sales and marketing to basically scale that business. And yeah. so, um, so like running a business is, is a lot like like running multiple physics experiments mm -hmm. and running a VC fund is like running, you know, few labs, yeah. uh, which, you know, if they tend to perform, you put more money in them sure. and then they tend to scale, you know, yeah. uh, hopefully, hopefully to, to, a big, to a big size. So, um, so the way that we've, quantified our you know visa business is uh, is basically taking that approach is um you know risk reward basis in terms of um, how we allocate dollars uh so it's very rr driven and um and dpi as a result driven um sure. because we look for you know how much return can we generate from any specific you know private market investing so it's very much similar to what the micro cap stock investing is um you get on a liquid stock initially and then if you're right and the company gets to 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 million dollars of revenue, that illiquidity, you know, disappears. Most companies, especially if you tend to focus on B2B software companies, upon reaching about 10 million dollars of revenue, um, you get a lot of interest from, you know, private equity buyers. And then also strategic tend to be more active around them because you've built or captured a portion of the market. Yeah. And so the liquidity discount starts to disappear. So your job as a as a fund manager, and we're investing predominantly at like Series A stage, you know, when there is like kind of a million or two or three million dollars of revenue, is to predict, in a sense, what's the likelihood of that experiment to reach like a ten million dollar mark with our capital. And so, um, and if we're right, that becomes liquid. You know, how far will it scale? It's a, it's a matter of uh, kind of a, a another a, a, another topic. Um, and some scale, some businesses scale, you know, to you know, hundred million dollars, yeah. hundred million dollars of revenue. Some businesses. How quickly are you looking to get to ten million? Because uh, you're doing Series A, right? So a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, like the 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 better performing portfolio companies, yeah. you know, tend to triple, triple. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. companies that have challenges, you know, either because of uh, you know regulation. return levels or regulation or you know, long sales cycles where it might be like, you know, very dependent on how the, you know, whether the market is buying or not, you know, in 2022 wasn't like 2023 wasn't an easy year, you yeah. know, especially for enterprise customers. Um, um, you know, you, you might take like three or four years. If it takes four years to get from one to 10 likelihood that this company will have challenges scaling beyond 10. Um, but, you know, we, we've been in shareholders in like chess.com, um, 
you know, since 2012. And, yeah. you know, sometimes you get surprises, uh, you know, by the market, you know, first pandemic hit, then Queen's Gambit hit, and the business, you know, went, you know, quite, quite viral uh, sure. during that period of time. And so it took a while to get to that double digit mark. Um, but then, you know, once it was, you know, the market leader in that segment, you know, and, and then the certain factors hit, the business almost unfolded, you know, in the course of a couple of years uh, from a $10 million mark. So, uh, so you might get sometimes, you know, surprises by the market, um, even though you, you know, you quantify the decisions, um, you get an external uh, externality that yeah. is, is a positive externality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, so tell, tell me a little more about the, the private equity side. So what were some of the things that you observed, the just notable things that you saw, you know, when you were working in private equity? And then how has that evolved? Uh, maybe at the revenue level, the business type level, uh, maybe funds that are invested in private equity. Just what, what's changed since you've been in private equity? Well, that was, you know, like more than a decade ago. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, historically, private equities have been, you know, much more, you know, offline businesses focused. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, uh, you know, as however, the, the challenge in this though is that you don't really have, you know, substantial growth rates. So, yeah. so all of the, all of the real like return drivers have been either around, you know, consolidating other businesses. And so you're unlocking this. But they're of already profitable. Most of them are probably profitable, right? They're even yeah, and they're like profitable. And so you, you might have some, you know, operational improvement, you know, driving even the margin from yeah. like, you know, 20% to 25%. You might have some multiple expansion. You always like, we're making money by taking, by taking leverage. Yeah. Um, and so, so there were, I, I'd say those were the factors, how people like mostly return money. Yeah. I think I think is, 10 years forward, um, you know, I think today, you know, and that's partly why private equity has really moved into 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 the space is that technology companies, they tend to still have inherent growth rates in them. And so so that's why you, you know, see, uh, you know, PSG and firms like PSG and like Tomo Bravo basically, you know, uh, taking taking a big piece of the market um, because you know it's not just you know being operationally prudent and and making that you know even the margin improvement and not just taking uh, the uh, the debt and you know doing doing the right transaction structuring but because software companies they actually have embedded growth in them predominantly because there is a net dollar retention component. Yeah. And so if you'll decompose, you know, where, you know, I think private equities today also make money, a lot of that, I don't have the data to back it up, but my gut feel is that like a lot of private equities really make money by just internal growth of, of their core platform yeah. business. Um, yes, you get a lot of the, you know, let's acquire some, some companies, but a predominant also portion of it really comes from just the business growing by itself. Yeah, um, I mean, I and so I think... My question to you is, you know, what industries were you in? Uh, because I appreciate there's a lot of software now, right? Or private equity is playing, but how involved was software in the PC space? Like, what, where were you playing? Like, were you doing software back then on the PC side, or was it more like no, no, it was it was more it was more traditional economies. So, like um, so they were, yeah. So we were looking at you know doing like some agricultural farms and you know like how to uh, you know acquire a couple of them and then the merge and uh, the operational improvements so it's like more financial case um so but it was nothing related to technology to be honest and so that's why i actually went from a private equity and like build a startup because it, yeah. it felt a bit slow and a little bit boring and technology definitely uh, like brought more excitement to to the table walk us through the origin to it how did you start the startup like what what motivated you to do it what was the problem I think the fact that I could like do it is, uh -huh. you know, you don't really need to do a lot of, you, I, I know how to code from, from yeah. school. And so I um, in most laser physicists do, or just most physicists like know how to code because you have to run experiments, you have to write some scripts. So, um, so I educated myself on, like Ruby on rails, you know, oh, wow. built the startup and, uh, and basically like built the team. Um, and uh, it felt like, you know, this is like, cool, let's, let's just build something and, and see what yields are, are we didn't really put too much thought about 
like what will like the monetization strategy will look like and what would be like the online conversion funnels yeah. so it was more a entrepreneurial urge to just do something um it felt like after and it was at the, around the time when uh, when facebook got um, got public so mm -hmm. as you can imagine it's like you you read like this is a hundred billion dollar company you know you could do it like okay how it's like you're not different from mark and you know that's 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 the underlying you know i think for mo a lot of the people like starting something is 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 about that it's, yeah. it's just like going and building something and like um like maybe like as a repeat time entrepreneur you kind of like really self-impose a lot of restrictions and you really think about okay is that a really big time and is that a really big idea that you know i'm like passionate about it but yeah. like when you do the first the first gig um it's it's a lot it's a lot like uh you know why don't you just go and do it yeah no, absolutely so what, tell me a little more about flashpoint you know your guys is you know sourcing and screening process kind of what your thesis is and what are you guys excited about um, sure what what has changed you know i mean I, I would say one more thing i would say before you jump into that is you know, on the private equity side, there's a lot of innovation in revenue-based financing. I think there's going, be a, there's going to be a lot of software platforms that can like, use, the, use the financial data, like, you know, these simple companies that are out there now. Um, you can plug your financial data in, and then all of that data can tell you, you know, your, your EBITDA, you know, what your, what your revenue multiple is. you got graphs and analytics from, like, last year. And, you can, and, and you know, a lot of that can be kind of really calculated. And possibly be automated. If you want funding, just plug in your your CRM and your um, your payment system, and then it could almost be like this AI private equity investor. Says, Look, you know, you're at this multiple. Uh, the business that you're in is a you know two trillion dollar market size. Um, here's your competitors because they pull in all the data from Facebook or whatever. And you know a lot of things that we use our minds to do. I feel like there's now nodes and structures that could probably sit down and get on way to possibly like offer a transaction. Right? And I don't know what your thoughts are on it. How far away are you? I mean, there are software that people use to onboard that process. And then, you know, on the founder side, there are software now that like founders can go in and, you know, kind of explore funding, you know, revenue. Um, so where do you see that intersection at some point where yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we, the VC like organization, um, you know, that we, um, that we invest from is basically, um, it focuses on kind of series A stage yeah. when it's still like relatively early. And so there are still a lot of unknowns and, and they're all high growth businesses. So yeah. when we come in, um, they you know, tend to grow like, you know, hundred percent, 200 percent, 300 percent. So, um, and so there is a lot of still uncertainty about like what's what's to come and how long will the will, will that you know persist and you know how scalable um, the user acquisition channels are. And so uh, when we started Flashpoint like twelve years ago, the first fund was you know, more consumer centric. You know, a lot of the a lot of the markets weren't really weren't really um, still taken. And so we backed like company like Chess.com. Yeah. Um, and it was like basically a play on, on mobile and, um, they were just getting into, into the app store and, um, and, and Google store. And so, um, so that, you know, played out quite well. Um, eventually general Atlantic acquired that business for about $650 million. And so, um, you know, we, we back company like Shazam, which got acquired by Apple. So, oh, yeah, yeah. um, and so, you know, in fund two, we went into B2B like uh, motion and marketplaces in fund three and back companies like, like guest here, which just announced like it's series F from KKR. Yeah. Um, and so in fund three, we went, you know, predominantly into, um, continue to do more like B2B software. So 95% of what we do today is B2B software. Um, and then, you know, we also started to focus more on uh, like AI and machine learning, um, as like those technologies really got, you know, mainstream adoption. Um, and, you know, we're now, you know, companies like Test Trigger, uh, which we backed a few years ago, you know, really started to, you know, generative AI has, has really been at the forefront. Um, so, um, so I think, you know, in terms of as, as a generalist VC fund, 
I think you really need to be, you know, anticipating where the pluck is going and, yeah. you know, not where it is today. Sure. And, and as we, you know, start to uh, raise our fund four, you know, we're also thinking about the climate technologies. I think over the last like couple of years, that's, there's been a lot of talk. I think the regulation is coming um, or it's increasing and there is a lot of like net zero, um, net zero talk by public companies that it's important. Um, I think, you know, the social, um, social movement also, you know, propel that, you know, yeah. path forward and that it's, you know, you'll not just need to, you know, make money, but also be socially responsible. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that impacts, you know, uh, corporates to, you know, start paying attention. So, yeah. uh, so that's one also one of the sectors where, you know, we're spending more and more time. Um, but, you know, today, you know, 95% of what we do is B2B software. Um, this is the most, I'd say, predictable and scalable way to make money. I mean, if you got the product right and at a series A stage, you kind of get that just, you know, is there a net dollar retention? You know, how good usually the company by series A stage has, you know, 20, 25, 30 people. So you can already get a feel of, you know, whom can the founders hire and how good are they at hiring the first level of, you know, execs or middle managers. Maybe it's still not that VP level person, but, you know, yeah. it's head of, head of somebody. Um, and so you can get that first understanding how good like the founder is able to transition out of a founder role into a kind of a CEO role. It's yeah. still not like to the fullest extent, mm -hmm. but you know, because that typically happens by kind of their by 20, 10 to 20 million dollars that when they really phase out and yeah. really like kind of grow into their you know professional CEO roles. Mm -hmm. But you can get the gist, like you know, can the how the founder thinks, you know, what what is his you know, action steps have been to really grow into kind of yeah. ex-founder to like a, a proper CEO role. Um, yeah. So, um, so, but, um, you know, VC has definitely changed quite a bit over the last decade. Um, yeah, but if you're not curious, you know, where, you know, the markets are heading and, you know, you're not always like researching and, you know, grinding, I think it's, it's a very, it's a very competitive market yeah. uh, in general. So. No, absolutely. What are some ways to be able to parse out AI? You know, for a lot of these AI companies, there's companies that are not AI companies, but you now they're branding themselves um, having some type of um, automation or AI. So, what are when you're diligenting these companies, maybe in the first or second pass, what are some telling signs that maybe this could be a winning thing, especially in the early stage? Yeah, and I mean, not all AI is created equal in that sense. I think um, if you look at, you know, how the like value capturing um, mm -hmm. is taking place, you see that a lot of the horizontal SaaS companies, um, they the ones that have been built out over the last decade um, from, you know, Workday to Salesforce to HubSpot to, um, uh, to ServiceNow, to, I don't know, UiPath, you name it. Like, I mean, like, there's a lot of horizontal SaaS companies. And so a lot of the value that AI has really created, you know, with, you know, GPT models uh, specifically, and like with the LLMs being like uh, the core, the core capturing mechanism um, is, this is where like those companies will more likely to capture value rather than the new companies. And so when we look at, you know, certain um, industries, this is like where we believe like, like with AI that there's going to be value created. Yeah. So like, for instance, like in hospitality and travel, you know, we've built like a solid track record and, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's an industry that is, you know, not very keen, you know, to, to innovate very quickly. And so people who, you know, know the industry, who've got like relationships in it, you know, when applying, uh, you know, AI and, you know, LLM specifically to set of problems, you know, there, there is, you know, long-term modes created because there is a business mode. It's very, like, not an easy one to get in. Like construction is one of, like, other niches. It's very hard to actually build, you know, something if you're not, you know, coming from a construction industry. You really have to, you know, love what you're doing and, you know, customers need to understand that you breathe and leave their industry, right? Yeah. Also healthcare, like, it's one of those, you know, niches where, you know, it's like not everybody can go and just build like productivity successful. So we look for founder product fit, yeah. or founder market fit, 
And so, you know, we want to understand that the person has really lived through, you know, the problem. Um, and if he hasn't, you know, she hasn't, you know, that that's a really red flag because it's very hard to like build sustainable value in those industries if you haven't really lived through the problem like yourself. Um, but, you know, also, you know, in, in the in the world of AI is like how much data do you do you have? Like a company like Test Sugar is an example, you know, it processes like a million tests a month, right? So, so they've got, you know, internal data done by the QA tests. And so, um, so they have, they can train their, um, their, their model um, to actually generate new, new, new value. And so if you're like trained, because if you look at all of the LLMs, you know, now that Apple has, you know, trained their own model and their, like their last model is you know much more smaller parameters wise versus like open ai's model and it's already on par if not better so it kind of tells you that if you're taking the the same exact data set you know whether that's you know quora or you know open internet scraping and um or some other you know data sets you know wikipedia and like or, or others you know basically like there is no like ultimately value you know everything just gets cheaper yeah. You know, and the question is who's got the faster model in that sense. But if you've got like proprietary data set, this is what's valuable. And so um, if the company like doesn't have it, it's very hard to create like a sustainable value and mode, a technological mode uh, or product mode in, in, in the era of AI. Yeah. Um, so, so this is like some of the things that when we kind of look at series A stage, you know, whether there is, you know, just bes besides traction is how much of a, like founder market fit is there and like how much, you know, data mode is there really? How much, um, well, let me really rephrase. What advice would you give to someone who is evolving from, fun, maybe from fund one to fund two, and now you guys are on fund three, right? So like, because you, know, you guys, it sounds like you guys had a little bit of a pivot even in the industry focus, right? So how should people think about that as they're, you know, building their institutional firm? And, you know, how should they tell that story? I think just like any business, uh, like uh, you cannot stop selling. So if you're a fund manager that kind of like raised its first fund and like yeah. you know, kind of thought that you could stop fundraising, you, you can't really stop fundraising. You're sure. always fundraising. Yeah. And uh, just like any entrepreneur that is actually running like the, the company, that's the companies that you invest in. And so um, it's a... You know the the venture capital business um you know is really operates on you know constantly raising money um it takes time to you know build trust with you know limited partners and and so they understand your strategy how unique you are versus the rest of the market and how you can build systemic alpha and so um, if you're not constantly raising it's like you're gonna have challenges because not every it's not always up up and away sometimes i i'd rather say that vc is a chainsaw business so everything is like great until until it's not, then it's like, you know, you yeah. drop dead. And so, uh, so it's a very complicated model from funding perspective mm -hmm. because everybody's kind of, like it's a, a game of musical chairs. Uh, yeah. So um, so if you're not constantly raising, it's uh, you might have challenges. And so you need to uh, keep on doing that. I think you need to love what you do and always be curious. Yeah. Um, if you're not specific in, I mean, in general, this is a business about like curiosity and how to, uh, how to structure that, uh, how to farm that insight, uh, um, out of the market and, you know, provide capital to, to people who are also curious enough and builders, and, um, but just keep on learning and, you know, keep on reading and keep on talking to people. And, uh, this is an industry where you will make mistakes. Uh, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. And so I think it's a question of how can you quickly, can you quickly reflect on your mistakes and, uh, and, uh, you know, learn from it and like, move on. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, this was uh, really great. You know, really enjoyed getting married a little better. Thanks for uh, making time for us and um, excited to, uh, to stay in touch and hang out in New York at the next cocktail event. Awesome. All right, man. Take care.